So if we had a picture of the sanctuary, um, we could just draw a rectangle, okay? And in this rectangle, if you come in one end of it, there's a door. And you have the outer court. And then you go from there, it's divided. It's divided in, say, let's say thirds. I don't know if that's exactly what it is, but we'll just do that for simplicity. You have the outer court, you have the holy place and the most holy place. And um, it's important to see what God did here. In Hebrews, we learn that this is that what Moses made for the people was a copy of what was in heaven. And we learn that in Revelation again, that it was not what was not that that the temple is in heaven. Um, and that it's made with not with human hands. It's better than than what we copied. Obviously, it was made by the hand of God. So in that outer court, the first thing you come to is an altar of burnt offering, uh, which is a sacrifice, a place that you would bring your lamb. So as we think about this sanctuary, um, as we come to the sanctuary, what we see is a wall around the sanctuary. It's 12, 14 feet tall. It was made of white linen. Uh, which is a little bit shocking to me to be out in the desert and everywhere else and, and carry this white linen. There must be a reason for it to be white linen. Um, so you have this wall of white linen around. You enter through the gate and you come to this altar of burnt offering where you brought your lamb. What is the... What happens when they offered a lamb on the altar? What effectively were they, was this to display? When the people would bring a lamb, they place on the altar a spotless lamb. Well, who is that representing? Jesus. It was representing Jesus. And then they would play the lamb, and then the high priest would take the blood and sprinkle it on the horns of the altar, and then he would minister in the rest of the sanctuary with this blood. And you were forgiven. Okay. The second thing we see in the outer court was the lavery, which represents a washing. Um, if we look at, there's many Bible verses. Um, that I'll just try and bring them up. But though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. So when you come into the sanctuary, you present your lamb. Now it's Jesus Christ. You're washed. And what do you see around you? White raiment. You're surrounded with white raiment. We can read in Revelation and in John. Um, before I move on here, I'll just read. Uh, let's see, Revelation 3, verse 8. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. God is speaking here. This is red letters. I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. So this door to the sanctuary, if I had a drawing of it here, is an open door. He's set before you. That means everyone. God has opened a door that no man can shut for you. We come to the altar. We come to the sanctuary. And we're washed. And we're given white raiment. We leave our sins there. And we're gifted the righteousness of Christ. Which is the white raiment. Now in life. We have by heredity. And by personal choice, a sinful nature. So, as Paul said, the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I want to do, I don't do. Oh, sinful man that I am, wretched man. Um, all these things that he's clarifying to us. Because he's wanting you to not feel discouraged. Because we can be discouraged in our walk. We come to Jesus. We ask him for forgiveness. He washes us, 
And we go back and we start into life and doggone it, we do the same thing again. Or we do something different. We, we missed up. And Satan's like, you're not good enough. But what does God say? My grace is sufficient. Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So God is essentially setting before us an open door, walking us into the sanctuary, presenting his blood in the outer court, and washing us, and we receive his white linen. The struggle here that I think uh, I didn't fully grasp, and I still don't, but is that I don't, even though I've been forgiven, I can fall again. And I continue on my walk, and I may need to come back to this part and receive that white raiment again. I may need to confess my sins again. It may not be a one-time thing for Jeff. In fact, it isn't. It hasn't been. So in the outer court, we are forgiven which means under the law, what are we? Yeah. Well, if we're forgiven, it's oh. not put against our record because we learned early that Christ became that. So who's guilty? Christ is now guilty. You're set free. So he became sin for me so that I could become his righteousness. So I'm in the outer court and Christ has become sin for me. I am now justified. I go before God as if I didn't sin. He looks at me and he sees his son and he's like, yeah, you're, you're justified. You're, you're just. So that's justification. It happens in the first part of the court. Christ is walking us through the sanctuary and we're justified right there. The issue is do we stop there? Does Christ stop there? Mm -hmm. What does he do? He opens the door to the holy place, right? So we walk into the holy place. And what articles do we find there? Incense, showbread, and light. So we have a table of showbread. And it's got 12 <clears throat> loaves representing all 12 tribes of Israel. And Israel represents who? The true church or the people that will be saved for Christ's kingdom, oh, right? God. So that's all the people that are going to be saved. So there's enough bread for all people. And there's a bunch of verses here. Um, uh, John, let's look at a couple. Just look at one. Since, um, look at John chapter 6, verse 33. So this bread in there has represented Jesus, that he is the bread of life. He, anybody that eats of him will never be hungry. Um, then we look across the holy place and we see the seven lampstands. Um, these were continually burning. They never went out. If they need to light them, they, you know, they kept them always burning. And we there's many verses um, that talk about Jesus being the light of the world. So we got the light, the bread, and the incense. And the incense, what does that represent? It's the prayers of the people that have accepted Jesus. So I'd ask you, are you receiving nourishment from his word? Are you feasting on him? The altar of incense represents the merits and intercession of Christ, his perfect righteousness imputed to us. So as we spend that time in the middle here in the holy place, um, Christ has walked us through, and we're feasting on him. We're being lighted by his light. He's the light of the world. We're being fed by his bread. His righteousness is imputed to us and connected with our prayers. They're going to God, and God is speaking to us through prayer. And we're being changed. As we feast on him, as we look to his light, and as we pray, we're being changed. By beholding, we become changed. 
And what do we find in this process in the middle? What is inbred? What is lighting these candles? And what is mixed with the incense? And in the incense, there's oil. So what are we seeing in this holy in this holy place? The Holy Spirit at work. The Holy Spirit's working through all of it to bring us through the sanctuary. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your Holy Spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we entered the outer court, we were justified. We were forgiven. We were washed as white as snow. And we go out and we fall again, as Paul said. Maybe we don't. But many of us have, okay? But if we continue on the walk with Christ, he doesn't leave us in the outer court. He walks us into the holy place. And in the holy place, we have the Holy Spirit working on us. We're feasting on his word. We're looking at the light of his word. He's shining light into the darkness in our lives. With this lamp that's always burning. And our prayers, he's mixing his himself with our prayers to the Father. And the Father's communing with us and changing us. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to protect us. Anytime we build a wall around anything, a house or a, a fence, what are we trying to do? Maybe it's containing your animals, um, but most likely it's for protection for your family. And God is actually, through his son, wanting to protect his children. He's inviting us. He's set before us an open door. He's walked us into the outer court and he's removing the sin from our lives right there immediately. Boom. But we still have this desire and this propensity to sin. And so he's wanting to remove that because we found back in Gethsemane what happens when sin is in our lives. It's an oil press. And so if he, if we can if we hang on to that, we're pressed. We're going to press the Holy Spirit out of our lives, and we're crushed, just like Christ was crushed. He doesn't want that for us. He knows what that is, and so he loves us so much. He's like, journey with me. Keep going. And he, through spending time with the bread, the light, and the prayers, and the Holy Spirit working in our lives, Jesus actually changes us into his likeness remember in creation he said let's make man in our image male and female and there's there's a whole sermon there but somehow when a male and a female are joined in a marriage their characteristics better represent god than individually somehow god is in women and men and somehow yeah. it's it's so God made us in his image. But then when Adam and Eve fell, remember, they all of a sudden realized they were naked. They lost the image of God because they took on sin. That's not God's image. So God has essentially walked us in the outer court. Now he's taking us through the holy place. And he's recreating us into his image. Amen. So God is in this middle court. We saw justification. Now what is sanctification? So Thessalonians 5.23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body preserve, be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we have to be preserved blameless, that means we would be blameless. So we become blameless, but preserving us blameless is the process of sanctification where God makes, he creates in us a new heart and renews a right spirit within us. And so in this process of the sanctuary, it's not, I don't see it as a one-time thing. That this may be a process, as Paul said, I die daily. That you are surrendering, and if, you, if there's something wrong in your life, 
you give that to Christ and you feast on his word and you look at his light and he sends the Holy Spirit to work in your life. And you, it's a growing process. And that's the middle court where you're being sanctified, which is means you're being made like him. You've surrendered and you want him to live his life in you. Um, so the last part of the, the sanctuary, I know we're brushing through this quite quickly, um, is the holiest of holies, the most holy place. Um, if it makes it the most holy place or the holiest of holies, we expect to find somebody there, right? If it's the, if it's defined the most holy place, um, we know what makes things holy, but we'd expect to find, we've, we've come to Christ in the outer court. In the middle court, we've come to Christ and the Holy Spirit, and they're both working with us, and they're interacting with God. But we expect when we get to the most holy place, we're going to find all three. In Revelation chapter 11, we find in the most holy place, what? What object? So we have the ark. Inside the ark is what? The law, the Ten Commandment law that God wrote with his own finger. Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod. Pot of man. Pot of man. Bread of life. On top of the ark was what? Mercy seat. The mercy seat. The mercy seat is sitting on top of the law. The law is underneath the mercy seat. On each end of the ark, overshadowing the mercy seat are what? Two cherubim. Two angels. Two angels. I'm going to read you a quote. And this is from a book entitled God's Amazing Grace. The Lord is in his holy temple, but all the earth keeps silent before him. Habakkuk 2.20 As I saw a throne, and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold. For a cloud of glorious light covered him. And I asked Jesus if his, if his father had a form like himself. He said, yes, he does. But I could not behold it. For he said, if I should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. I saw the father rise from the throne in a flaming chariot go into the holy of holies within the veil and sit down. Then a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire surrounded by angels came to where Jesus was. He stepped into the chariot and was born to the holiest where the father sat. Then I beheld Jesus, a great high priest, standing before the father. Two lovely cherubs, one on each side of the ark, stood with their wings outstretched above it and touching one another, each other above the head of Jesus as he stood before the mercy seat. Their faces were turned towards each other, and they looked downward to the ark, representing all the angelic hosts, looking with interest at the law of God. Between the angels was a golden censer, and as the prayers of the saints offered in faith came up to Jesus, and he presented them to his father, a cloud of fragrance arose from the incense, looking like smoke of most beautiful colors. Above the place where Jesus stood before the ark, so Jesus is standing where? Before the ark, right at the mercy seat. Above the place where Jesus stood, before the ark, was an exceeding bright glory that I could not look upon. It appeared like the throne of God. Our crucified Lord is pleading for us in the presence of the Father at the throne of grace. His atoning sacrifice, we may plead for our pardon, our justification, and our sanctification. The lamb slain is our only hope. Our faith looks up to him, grasps him as the one who can save to the uttermost, and the fragrance of the all-sufficient offering is accepted of the Father. Praise God. God never chose to be a judge. I want that to sink in. 
God never chose to be a judge. We forced that on him. We chose sin. And he's now got to make justice of that. So what does he do with the sin of the world? He placed it on his son. <clears throat> and that's why Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. If we accept Jesus Christ, the sin stays with Jesus. But if we reject Jesus Christ, God gives us free will. If we say, I don't want Jesus, I don't want anything to do with them, then the Father honors our choice. He allows our choice, and he will give us our sin back. Much of the world doesn't understand this, that God gives free choice. But God said early on in the Bible, the wages of sin is death. We know that sin in our life is an oil press. It crushes the Holy Spirit out of our lives. And it was only God and his spirit and Jesus that give life. So if we crush them out, we're going to die. It's no different than if you took an oil tree and pressed it till all the sap ran out. It's going to die. That's what sin does. It chokes us. It presses us. It destroys us to the point we're going to die. And God knows that. But he made a way, but he didn't force the way. So he takes the sin of the world, gives it all to his son, and his son is pressed completely free of the Holy Spirit and dies on Calvary. The Holy Spirit left him with that, all that sin of the world. He became the sin. So there's a choice before us. Do we want to journey through the sanctuary? Do we want to be a dwelling for the Holy Spirit? Do we want Christ to live in our heart? Or do we want to be the person we were before? Do we want to be ourselves or do we want not I that live, but Christ that lives in me? You see, God honors our choice. And he will allow us to carry our own sin if we choose that, if we reject his son. But if we accept his son, the sin stays with his son until you see, God is just. And it was never right for Jesus to become my sin. There's not an angel or a human being that's got any sense of a mind that would say it was right for Jesus to become what you did, Jeff. Every bad thing in my life, Jesus became guilty of. He became that. I'm not really okay with that. I am so grateful because I know if he didn't take that from me, because that was my choice to do those things, I would die. But thankfully, he took that from me at the cross. And now if I accept him as my personal sacrifice, and I'm willing to just walk through the sanctuary with him. It's already done. It's just a walk. It's just a journey. It's a daily choice to feast on the bread, to pray, and to let the light shine into my life. That sin is given to Christ. But we know in the sanctuary process that their day of atonement came once a year. And that represented a one-time event for God. And I don't have the Bible verses here. I won't get into it, but I'm going to conclude with that. Jesus took all the sin of the world. There isn't one sin that he didn't become. That is a heavy thought. Incomprehensible, actually. If you took just Brother Andrew and myself and combined our sin, that's enough. 
you know, and you start, you start branching out and it's incomprehensible what he became in the garden and on that cross. But that wasn't justice. And we have to look at God and say, okay, he is love. He is merciful. He is full of grace and truth and he is just. It just, it's in his time frame when he brings justice and he delays it to the last ever moment because he never wanted to be a judge. He wants to be your friend. He wants to be your father. He has eternal plans for you. He loves you beyond measure. It will never grasp. You can look at your little kids and that's the closest thing you'll even begin to understand how much love he has for you. But God is forced to be a judge because we took on sin. And when I choose to kill Brother Andrew, God's forced to make that right. It's no thing, nothing different than a parent. When you have children and one of the kids takes a stick and whacks the other one, and you're as the parent sitting there going, I never wanted that. I never wanted that. But I just saw it happen. And I wouldn't be loving to let that continue to happen and not do what I can to stop it. So because of our choices, God is forced to do something. To bring people to heaven that don't love his son, don't accept his son, and want to kill everybody they see, wouldn't be a loving God. So he's got to do something about it. What it is, is he allows the choice. You either bring your sins to the altar, to Jesus Christ, and you're washed as white as snow, or you can hang on to him. You can have him back. Jesus took him, but he'll give him back if you don't accept him. Because Jesus had to do it once for all. So in the end, as the sin was transferred to a scapegoat, Satan is always represented as a goat. All the repented and forgiven sins will be given, given back to the instigator of those sins. And Satan will pay the penalty, the sure penalty of those sins, which is death. So that's a synopsis of what I found. Um, the sanctuary is a place of protection. If sin destroys us and the walk to the sanctuary removes that sin, then we're no longer being pressed. The oil is no longer being pressed out of us. So it's life. The sanctuary is a place of protection. And then as you progress through, you went from the white linen to the golden walls. You're being purified. Gold is pure. You enter the golden walls, and those walls around you are meant as a place of protection from all the Satan, all the different ways he wants to trip you up and destroy you. To be aware of new videos like this one, be sure to subscribe to the Preparing for the Time of Trouble channel. For more free videos and downloadable audio podcasts, as well as handouts, go to www preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com. Topic categories include recordings of live seminar presentations, country living, sustainable gardening, homestead remedies, how to be self-sufficient when the grid goes down, wild edible and medicinal plants, hydrotherapy, and end-time Bible prophecies. To take advantage of these free resources, go to preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com. Dot com.